everyone. Thank you for coming to today's event. My name is Charlotte Hook, and I am our Senior Program Manager at Factory Berlin. Our vision at Factory Berlin is to give every creator an empowering network. Uh, at the heart of what we offer is community. We are a curated community of over 5,000 creators and innovators who are all, what they have in common is they're all reimagining the world. Tonight's masterclass is with Sebastian Grice, and it's on startup and corporate collaboration. Uh, startup and corporate collaboration is, of course, a really powerful way to survive in the market. However, it is very difficult to hack, and so he's here to tell us a little bit more about that. Sebastian has built more than 50 long-term game-changing partnerships between startups and corporate units in the last 10 years, so I'm sure we have a lot to learn. Um, and uh, with no further ado, I'd like to invite him to stage. So hello everyone, um, it's really a blast being here, uh, it's, it was a long time not being with people, no, still the pandemic, and um, thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Charlotte, for, for the kind introduction, and um, I'm really preparing myself for some tough questions, I recognize some faces from, um, from people that I know, uh, so really, really um, looking forward to the journey that we have today and getting you some insights. Today morning, I opened up my news feed and all the articles inside there were about the pandemic, about the war, about the uncertainties that each and every one of us are feeling currently. Notice it's, it's, it's more intense than ever before. The cycles are becoming shorter than ever. And there's not only those uncertainties that we currently see there, but it's also the uncertainties of the underlying technology changes that each and every industry is facing. And I would like to use that talk and have a discussion about how partnerships and especially startup corporate partnerships can help to overcome those uncertainties and help to have a competitive advantage inside of your industry. My name is Sebastian Kreis. I didn't have any entrepreneurial background when I was young. Um, the first baby footstep into that direction were when I was uh, delivering the newspaper, collecting the money, finding new customers. No, but on a serious note, um, my parents, my father was a construction engineer, my mom was a nurse, so I didn't have any entrepreneurial background. Lucky though, I was joining the entrepreneurship program at the TU Munich. And that was just, um, but they teach us the fundamentals, the fundamentals of entrepreneurship. That means like finding your ideas, identifying and assessing your idea, finding the right team, building your technology and really building up the prototypes that you need in order to see whether it scales and then executing on your strategy as well. So that was the moment where I got really into the whole game of how can technology be used to have an impact on our everyday lives, on the industries that we are in. And especially um, then I got hooked when, 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 when understanding how to do that. Um, and then I was lucky enough to have my studies at Stanford University. I was going there. And there, th that, that was really like a, a mind-blowing experience that I had back then. Seeing and listening and talking to people. One of the talks that I remember very well is Peter Thiel, and he explained how they changed, together with PayPal, the payment industry, and the, how they approached it. And not just having those bigger companies, but also having the, the young startups that just got recent funding into their, into their venture, and you realized how, how they're thinking big, and they're thinking how they can shake up industries and really become a category leader in their industry. Um, so coming then, and, and that's actually also something that I want to use that talk to, because what I believe is, the more we talk about, we do have to, still two separate worlds. We have the startup world, we have the corporate world. They are still very different. 
But the more we talk about it and the more we talk about the expectations of each and every industry, about uh, the different point of views that everyone has, about the failures and I see it in your faces now. Everyone can have some stories about the failures between those partnerships, but also the successes. And the more we talk about those, the more we increase this, uh, the chances of success. And this is the idea of today. When I was then coming back from the US, uh, I was going back to, to Germany. I had a short detour. I founded also my own company, which miserably failed. We didn't get a product market fit. So we closed it down, we took our lessons, and I moved on. I moved to Next47, which is the venture capital arm at Siemens HE, where we had around one billion under management. And the next step was then a founding Station X, which is the venture client unit of Siemens Mobility, where we do uh, try to close the gap, the technology gap between startups and Siemens Mobility. And I will give you a little bit more insights how we try to become a client to the startup later on and give you some, some parts on how we are doing that. And from, from, from all those experience that I had, there is the, the big learning that the lone wolf dies, but the pack survives. For me, this is essential, no? understanding really that you have to find your allies. There's no one corporate in the world who can tackle those uncertainties that I just mentioned on its own. You always have to share the risk and find a balance on the things that you can do internally and the things that you should, should partner up. And there are specific reasons why I believe partnering is so important. And there are basically three of them that I want to highlight today. The first one is what you see today as a big part of partnering, why we are doing that, is the acceleration of technology. Where we have previously, in the past, we've seen, we've seen technologies like the automotive, like electricity, it took uh, a long decade until it was kind of scaled into the mass market. It took a long time and people got used to that kind of technology. However, nowadays we are facing IoT, smartphones, tablets, the internet, artificial intelligence, you name it. But the thing with those technologies is that um, they, they, they have an exponential growth. So there is a certain tipping point when things are really taking off. And the issue for a big corporate is you need to understand the technology before that point, because if that point already is in, you're already too late. You can't move your tanker, you can't move your ship around from one day to another. So the huge challenge as a corporate is to really understand that kind of technology and at least assess it. You don't need to jump into that technology, but you need to understand it and be wise on that one. I always say you need to train your innovation muscle. You need to understand that. You need to be prepared in order to jump on that technology or to say, this is something that I'm not interested. Another thing is, what you see is, is really an explosion of ideas. There's, uh, if you look at the data from 2010 to 2018, those are the ideas that now become reality. And just a pure amount, there's three times more ideas pushed in the market than previously. And it's becoming more and more a challenge to understand all of those. It's not just the assessment, but you kind of, this is new solutions to existing problems. This is, could potentially, one of those solutions could potentially shake up your industry. So you have a high incentive as a corporate to really understand all of those. But the pure mass of all those, it's impossible to have an understanding or to develop it internally all by yourself. So the key idea is, how can you make that as efficient as possible, that you understand all the different ideas upcoming, all the different technologies, and how can you integrate it as efficient as possible in your organization? And it's not just a pure amount of, of ideas really going into, uh, into those markets, but it's also the funding. 
Um, if you look at mobility tech, for example, there are 20 billion US dollars invested each year into mobility tech companies. There's no company out there, no corporate who has a similar R&D budget. So it's just impossible for yourself to compete with that money. Nowadays, it could become a little bit less, uh, but in general, it will be in, in that, that amount. So you, and if you drill that really down to the feature that you have, um, because people are telling me Siemens has an endless budget. Yes, we do have a lot of budget, but as well, we do have a lot of opportunities, and that's the issue. No, you can't put all your money into one bucket or in all the buckets. We have our core buckets that we need to invest, then we have the things that we would like to, but maybe it makes even a lot more sense to partner up there, save our money, and put it somewhere else. So being, being very wise on which buckets should we build our core capabilities in, so which one of those are really essential for us no? and which of uh, the other ones are some, something that you could easily partner up with someone and accelerate your, your innovation. So thinking about all those three um, uh, things that you see in the market, I think that it's essential for every corporate as well as every startup to build an effective partnering uh, inside of your company. And there's one, there's, there, there's one because there's, um, there, there is a lot of potential. If you look at the different markets, no? if you look at corporates and startups, there's a huge potential if those two are collaborating. Um, on the corporate side, on, you do have a, a lot of capital. Usually, you do have access to the market. You have an understanding on where's the market going. And ideally, not always the case, you also have some scalability function. However, the fact is that corporates are incentivized by their shareholders to take the least amount of risk that they can do. It's all about efficiency, growing, but growing uh, very efficient. So you can expect a slow growth into big corporates. And this is usually what you see in the market. Um, but it's steady. On the other side, you see startups. You see, um, they are incentivized by venture capitalists to take risk, to take uncertainties, because uncertainties is the only reason why inside of a industry things are shaking up. And this is the only possibility that you can take a bigger share of the pie. And this is the idea of the return to the investor. So you have to find that, um, that angle where you can play that uncertainty. On the other side, you're trying to really find your credibility in the market. You find your uh, technical demonstrators, your first customers is one of the biggest things that, you, that you're that eager to, because first customers is replacing your investors, finally. But by bringing together those two in an efficient way can have a lot of potential. And le let's face it, as a corporate, the idea is really to, to strip down years and years of innovation uh, that you otherwise would have to spend on your own. And as well, venture capitalists are kind of like an extended R&D budget. No, people are spending money there, a lot of money that we can tap into and, and share the risk with other parties inside of the organization. And I would like to share one, one example. And it was a little bit too fast before. Um, one, one example that I was really surprised when I learned out about that. And that's the reason why I want to share that with you. Um, probably a couple of you have an iPhone. And I was really, really surprised because for me, Apple is one of the companies with best R&D out there. No, they have the most talented people. They are developing the crazy things. And my intuition was always they do that from internally. No, they develop it internally. However, I've learned that most of the tech that's inside of an iPhone was actually developed by, um, by startups. So what they do in Apple, they understand that there is great talent out there. They can't, with their own resources, they can't cover everything. They can't come up with all the ideas by themselves. But what they do, obviously, they screen the market, look for the best companies, look for, for the best uh, partners out there, 
and acquire them and integrate them in their products. And I'm pretty sure um, that they do test those technologies before they acquire them. No, they do the pilots, they do a partnership, even if it's behind the uh, closed curtain. They do that before acquiring that company. And this is also one of the reasons why we said we're going to found Station X. And Station X for us is really, we, we wanted to close the technology gap between uh, our internal experts and the startup. We said there is already someone out there who has a, a superb idea, has the best talent out there, was developing a technology. Let's talk to them and see how a pilot, how a partnership could look like and um, see how, how we can finally integrate them. We wanted to make it as easy as possible to do that collaboration. So we support our technical experts internally, and that's what we've built over the years, an extensive network into our organization, trying to understand all the issues that are in there, and then going out into the ecosystem. And what we do in detail, as I mentioned, is we we talk to our technical experts every day, every week, and ask them, what is your problem? What is the challenge that you're facing within the next one, two, three years? And we challenge them. Is that really something that you need to develop internally? Or is that something where we might find a partner who already developed that kind of technology outside? And what we then do is we're going to support those people and find, together with them, with the business unit, we find the best companies out there. We go in an active scouting and come up with a short list of companies that is specifically tailored to the criteria that we defined with our business units. We then support our business unit with the setup, with the contracting, with the scoping of the project, also a little bit with the financing, whatever necessary to make that as easy as possible. And one of the core capabilities that we've built is uh, that we always have in the teams people who understand both worlds, because this is crucial. You need to have those people on board who are eager to understand startup world, what is the motive, what is the need that they need at the moment, and what are, for example, the politics navigating internally inside of a corporate, what is the need, what kind of stakeholders do you need to involve. And then, ideally, what you have is, because we go from the early beginning in our framework, um, together with the business units, so we involve them in the decision which startups we're going to um, uh, work with, they go into the technology lead, and then the idea is we do that involvement from the very beginning because they are responsible for their business. And they are responsible then afterwards to uh, scale that technology to do the business because they have the access to the market. And I never wanted to do any projects where I do it like an R&D project and I don't have a clue what to do afterwards. Our intention was really always to, to start small with a pilot but then scale it with the organization. And one of the examples that I can give you in order to give you an ex to, to give you a little bit insight on what we are doing. Now we we do those projects actually for our internal processes. So we are digitizing our own processes. Uh, for example, our, our manufacturing, but also new features. So we're looking also into tech that we can bring to our customers and bring um, and, and generate additional revenue. One of the examples is a product, it's called a roadside unit. What it basically does is it communicates between a vehicle and infrastructure, so it enables the communication. What's inside there is a lot of hardware and a lot of software. And the interesting thing, so in the past it usually was you had developed that, that product and you shipped it to your customer and was installed there and never touched again. Nowadays, what we see is all those devices getting more and more connected. We do see more vulnerabilities, more security, safety issues in the market. And we also do see more updates on, for example, open source software. And all that um, 
started the need inside of our organization that we said we can't just deploy it once, but it will lead us to a continuous development cycle. And the issue was that there was a huge manual effort. Every time that we pushed an update, it was a huge manual effort to do the open source clearance, to do the vulnerability detection, and moving to a continuous development, we looked for a solution which at least semi-automatically was able to do that. We found v for, uh, uh, Vidu, and Vidu was actually acquired by JFrog for I think 350 million now, and they helped us actually doing that semi-automatically. And it was such a success, the pilot, that we afterwards scaled it to the, whole, to the whole team, to the whole development team of that product, and it's now saving us millions and millions each year. And this is the idea. Now we start small, and we go big afterwards. And those projects are actually uh, something that I'm observing inside of the industry a lot. More and more corporates understand what they're doing and that they want to engage with startups, that they're looking for other uh, allies in order to partner up. However, a recent study or a recent survey from Sifted mentioned that 72% of all the founders are unhappy with their, with their partnership, with their corporate relationship. For me, not completely surprising because I know a couple of them and how they're working. Um, however, this is still really, really bad. But let's, fa let's face it, it's uh, startup corporate co uh, collaboration is one of the toughest things that you can do. It's still like two complete separated worlds. No, there is so much misunderstanding and so much um, issues in those ones. And you need to really work on, on, uh, from, from the different levels. And however, what I've seen and what I've realized over over the course of the years, that you at least can increase the chances of success uh, when you have some, some basics. And we do, for example, we do have a, a framework that I showed you before. No, we do have that framework, but in a lot of cases, that just doesn't fit 100%. No, each project that we're doing is slightly different. So there's always a a different shareholders involved, different setup, different scoping, different financing. There's a lot of experience needed inside of an organization to handle that one and to make that really successful because you can't just plug and play those solutions. But the takeaways over the years that I met and the three, three fun fundamental things that I want to share with you that you can have a look out. I do. Um, sometimes I'm going deep diving a little bit more on the startup perspective, sometimes more on the corporate side. But I think it's necessary that both sides actually understand each other and have the same understanding of those ones. And things that, I, that I've seen is really start with the why. It's startups are sexy. Now it's like for a corporate, startups are sexy. Everyone is jumping into, we want to work with startups, we're going to do something. Uh, but they often neglect really that first step. The first step is asking you, why are you doing that? Why do you want to work with startups? Why is that so interesting? What kind of impact does that generate for you? I was at an event about a month ago. And it was really one, one of those flashy events. No, it was nice location, nice marketing slogans, uh, interesting speakers invited, and everyone was talking and chitting. And I kind of ha had a hard time understanding why are they actually doing that. So I was asking one of the employees and asked her, see here, I really don't understand what you, why you are doing that. What, what is the reasoning? And she just looked at me, extremely baffled, and she said, no, because everyone is doing it. You, you, you want to engage with startups. And I said, no, it's kind of probably not the right way. Because the, the, the thing is that when you are not fully aware of your why, why you're doing things, you end up doing everything. And in startup corporate collaboration, everything means everything. Now there's like a lot of things that you can do. You can do events, community events, but it, uh, it's, it's endless. And the thing is that at a certain point of time, your management will come and ask you what impact have you done over the time? 
What was your value add in your organization? And if you're not really clear on your why, you're probably also not very clear on what you're doing and why you're doing that. And then people are asking questions that you actually could have solved or, or which wouldn't happen if you would be clear on your why. As well, very interesting from a startup perspective, what I'm always saying is do your due diligence as a startup. If you look at a corporate as a partner, do your due diligence, look at what is their why, and then decide for yourself, is that really a partner that I want to go with? If I'm looking as a startup for a technical demonstrator and they do mo mostly R&D focused projects, that's completely fine. You're going to get your credibility in the market. You can build your first prototype together with them. But don't expect necessarily to be scaled afterwards because it could be that they don't just have the resources. They're not linked into the organization like that. So you always need to look how do you fit actually into that game and what is the value that you would like to get out. Another thing that I'm seeing as well, um, be obsessed about impact. As a startup especially, it's important to know your value and the value that you're generating for the corporate. And I do see so many, and I've observed that over time, that so many are still working on the features. Now, what kind of features you have, what kind of new technology you have. But finally, and this is something where we as Siemens, we are a technology company. Now, we love talking about technology. Um, don't mis misunderstand me. Yeah? But there is a certain point in time where we also get asked, what is the business value of that idea? Is it really necessary that we invest our resources in that kind of company or in that kind of solution? Or would it make uh, sense to put our money somewhere else? And as a startup, always think about how do you create money for the, uh, for the corporate and really think in terms of P&L. How, what are you changing for your customer? And then make that clear and then have the follow-up talks. Because the thing is, the more you talk, uh, the, the, the more impact you can generate, the more impact you're generating for your, for, for your customer, the, the more certain it is that you get a follow-up follow-on project, that the management will support that kind of endeavor and not just say, okay, this is another pilot and we stop it afterwards. But if you can show that from the very beginning. I do remember when I was setting up Station X, I was going to all the stakeholders in the organization. I had the idea on what I wanted to do and talk to them and ask them for feedback. And one of the conversation with the head of M&A, uh, Pankaj, was uh, see here, Sebastian, I fully, I'm fully buying what you're saying. The, it, it makes sense. The setup and the framework works. However, make clear that you work on a project that have a long-lasting impact on your organization. We're not interested and that hasn't any, does not have any future. If you look at the small project, those tiny projects, because you don't get the management attention. So you want to make sure to look for those projects who really create an impact internally as well. What we do since then differently is we challenge our um, internal experts from the very first day. So when they come up with a problem, we always ask them, what, what is the implication in terms of money? What is the business case behind that? And maybe you don't know it at the beginning, but at least let's have a discussion and see on what is the potential. And the closer we get to the pilot, the clearer we are on what is the value add. And we only go with those who have an impact on the organization where we can be sure that there's afterwards an adoption because it creates impact for us in the PL. And there's another point that I've observed is a lot of startups are cold calling, cold emailing, sending the pitches around randomly. Uh, the problem with that is you don't build credibility before. You don't have to trust that you need that people are taking you serious or, or having really like the time and take their time to understand what, you, what, what you're pitching them. 
I, I do remember one story where a startup founder was sending us a pitch deck uh, to myself and a technical expert. And the technical expert denied within one second and said, no, just not interesting. And I, because it's, I'm, I'm incentivized for it, no, I'm, I, I like uh, reading those, uh, those pitches, I was reading into them and I was thinking, if we slightly um, change the approach, it could actually make an impact. And this was only possible because I have the, the insights on what our organization needs and the transfer, the idea of how do you transfer the technology that is out there to that specific thing. So I was uh, calling my internal expert and talked to, them, talk to him and told him, see here, uh, just 15 minutes, um, I would like to talk to you why I do believe that this could really create value for yourself. So he agreed, and purely out of that reason, because I had a credibility with him. I was talking to him about his problems before, I, we had interesting discussions about technology, and we knew each other. So he was eager to spend those 15 minutes. Two minutes in the call, I was explaining to him, see here, this is why I think this is necessary, or this could, and he stopped and said, Sebastian, what you're just telling me is, and that would allow me to do X, Y, Z. And that was the moment where I realized, okay, now, now, now it's done. No, that was the moment where he was then eager and he called the startup afterwards. He was trying to get more information from the startup and he was really, really pushing for, for that one. And it's, it's important to know you can build that credibility on your own with the startup that you have into an organization as big as Siemens. Not an issue, it just takes a lot of time. And the thing is, usually as a startup, one thing that you don't have is time. Uh, so you wanna move fast. And there is nowadays, there are so many people, like me, talking today, but there are many people doing mentoring, there are many people out there who are really eager to, to, to engage with you and to navigate you in your organization. Just one disclaimer, do you uh, also think about what are their limitations? No, how are they linked into the organization? Because there's so many people just running around and walking around, talking a lot, but the thing is really, you need to see how does that really fit and, and how can they help. Use it as far as it makes sense, um, but, but don't expect them too much if it's not really linked to an organization or the impact that they can have. Um, I started out with the, the those, those are basically the three things that I believe really can have an impact and increase the chances of success. If you look at all the projects, my personal opinion is if a startup and a corporate at least have a basic understanding of those, they talk on ice level and they have, a, have a, an idea on where they're going and the, the chances are just a lot higher. Talking about the uncertainties, at the very beginning, I believe the uncertainties will become even harder for every one of us. So there will become more and more uncertainties in the market. The cycles are becoming shorter. And I personally believe that partnering is one of the core principles, the core competencies that every startup and every corporate has to build in order to stay competitive, in order to make really innovation uh, a reality. And so I'm, I'm really here and I'm looking forward to your questions in order to make that every day a little bit better and a little bit easier for both sides. So, thank you so much. Any questions? We raise a hand if you have a question. Uh, hello, Mr. Uh, guys, yeah. So <clears throat> I'm Gersi Kerritz. Uh, I'm really young at uh, business stuff, but I wanted to ask. So, as myself, I found uh, to start a new idea, new startup, a little bit hard. So I need someone who has a little bit more experience, so a friend or a partner. So, uh, do you think that this is important in the when you are starting a startup to have a partner in it? I, I think this is one of the most crucial things. Now, when we, when we look at startups, we have basically three main criteria that we look at. This is 
team, and this is what you're talking about. No, how, how much credibility does the team have? How much experience does the team have? The second one is traction. How much traction do they have in the market? Is there already a proof what they're doing? Is it working? And, and, the, second, uh, and the third one, because we're a technology company, we look at the tech. Um, but I believe strongly that it's essential to have a look at the founding team, how they interact with each other, especially when it's in the early stages. Because that's make, it, it's making or breaking it, correct? So if, if, if I've seen so many companies, especially in the early days, if they don't work properly together, when they haven't met each other before, it's also kind of like sometimes tricky. Um, but uh, I believe if you find the right co-founder, it's like a marriage. No, it's it's you, you have to. You're going through tough times. No, fa let's face it, it's never easy. And you either you you like your partner or you don't. And you have a chance of communicating a lot. You're spending a lot of time with them. So make sure that you find the right one. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, at some point, you mentioned technology adoption. Yeah. And I was wondering um, if there are any. W what are the telltale signs of incoming trends? Um, how do you distinguish, as a corporate or as an any person, as any person for that matter, between hype? and the trend that is actually going to be big? Is there anything that comes into mind? Yes, you're asking how to assess whether it's a trend or something that you should really put your money down on, correct? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm, for example, I'm, I'm very passionate about the hydrogen industry, mm -hmm. but currently there's a lot of hype uh, behind it. Got it. Yeah, so so at Siemens in general, we do have different approaches. Now we have uh, people who are really looking into trends. What is the future trends and making a picture of the future? How how does the future look like? Um, we we do have a central R and D function which is working on every technology that you can imagine. So we go to them as experts and talk to them. How ready is that technology? How feasible it is? Often we get a very technical answer on that one. No, how how ready is hydrogen? Um, what I've realized as well, one, one of the values that we generate from Station X is actually providing that kind of information. Because I believe, see here, um, I look at startups as well as an early indication on what is working, what is not. Because you're sharing, there's so many people involved in one startup from different perspectives, funding them, putting the money into them, and expecting a return within seven or eight years usually yeah so they expect to have what what i talked before a big pie in that area and they usually should only put their money into that so it the hydrogen very early stage or, or long long um, investment cycles or long investment that you need to put in that's slightly different but what we are doing is we, we are really pushing back that kind of information each and every time that i'm talking to one one of the founders, one, one um, on, on an event or when I, I'm scouting for them. This is one data point for us in order to assess, is the technology ready or is that an upcoming technology and should we engage? And the final step is we do a pilot. Now, when we believe, okay, this is really ready, we do a pilot. And even in the pilot, it could turn out that the technology is just not there yet and, and it's just all promised. But then we just spend a little bit of money instead of like a lot of money. And this is something that people, especially in corporates, like. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is um, how would you des describe traction, especially when we talk about more sophisticated technology? About more sophisticated technology. technology yeah. um, so what, what, what we are looking by, by traction, what I mean is we're looking, we're looking at, at typical things like uh, revenue, things that you can measure, but we also look at how much funding that they get, um, how much uh, venture capital funding, 
what kind of uh, venture capitalists invested in them. We also look at uh, what kind of reference customer do they already have, what kind of uh, companies that they already work with, and especially what kind of engagement was it? Was it a, a, a pilot? Was it a trial, a free, uh, free trial, a pay trial, uh, in order to assess uh, the traction that they already have in the market? It's always case by case, uh, by the way, because we, I'm, I'm not looking into, most of the time, I'm not looking into SaaS companies or something like that. No, that, that it's easy to, to measure the traction. You have an easy way of measuring it. We look at a lot of uh, qualitative, but also quantitative factors in order to assess what kind of stage are they in and does it really make sense to collaborate with them? Because this is a, a huge difference. The, the reason why I'm saying that is you, you have a specific expectation uh, inside of a corporate. No, in our case is we want to scale afterwards. No, we are not stopping with the pilot. So we want to scale afterwards. So we can't uh, work together with each and every startup, but we need to be sure um, that they are capable of handling, first of all, us, no, but be ready with the product, with the team, in order to go that, because we want to grow together with them. And, and that's also limiting, in a sense, um, the, the, the companies that we're working with, but makes it very clear from an expectation management for both sides what to expect. And, and I'm always giving that honest feedback if companies are not ready. <laughs> I, I do, uh, fun, fun fact, uh, that I had a conversation with a single founder. Uh, he had an idea on a PowerPoint and he thought he's going to change the world and he wants a collaboration together with Siemens. And I told him, honestly, that's just not working out. No, it's like this can't work out because you're then talking about IP and everything that things are getting really complicated. Why not just give him a paycheck and that's it. But he insisted and he was writing an email to our CTO back then, Roland Busch, which is now our CEO, and pitching his idea. And how it happens, it's then tripling down you know, to me, and he's asking me, who's that guy? What does he want? What should we do? I told him, yeah, I talked to him before, blah, 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 blah. And then he get a polite email back that we're not interested. But this is really a, a sensitive topic, and I believe for every corporate partnership and startup partnership, finding the timing right. You now, uh, your company, is it ready? for the corporate, but as well as the corporate ready for your startup. Now, because it could be that there is a certain topic inside of a company and the people haven't done the research there yet. They haven't done, uh, haven't decided internally. Is that a technology that they want to really pursue or is it only just trying currently? So you have to look very carefully and get also understanding what is the internal decision processes and does the timing of your corporate as well work for your startup. Well, thank you for your ideas. Uh, I'm not about investments, I'm about pilots. We are a startup that developed uh, metasurface technology for antennas mm -hmm. from 10 to, to 200 gigahertz. Is there some fields uh, where Siemens maybe need uh, some antennas? cooperation <laughs> yeah, in the... <laughs> No, it is equipment based on this and yes. uh, I, I don't have a specific search field currently, but uh, we can have a talk afterwards about the details, what you're doing and how, how that might fit in. And I'm happy to um, see how, how that really relates. And may, maybe I, I do have some ideas where it might fit in. Sure. Love to. Hi, thank you. Hi. Um, you were talking earlier about the team being like a very important factor for your decision making. Yeah. But when dealing with startups, a lot of the time you have very young founders. And so a question for me is, how do you gauge experience or how do you recommend to young startups to position themselves as founders, as um, being credible in an industry where they lack, uh, let's say, years of experience there? I, I, I believe you have to find a way to build credibility. And credibility can be built on a different amounts. No? You can fake it until you make it. No, it's like you 
put up big billboards and suddenly everyone believes in you, you're putting up a web page. So there's, there's um, the sense of you need to build real credibility in the market by proving that you the, the things that you promise that you actually can deliver. And this is just step by step. So this is like first steps. And I, I would say really like look for specifically the things that you can build your credibility on. No, you could, one, one of the things is what a lot of people in the US do very strongly get a good advisor on board early on, which is recognized as one of the key experts in that area. Not some, someone randomly, not your uncle or whatever it is, but someone really recognized in the industry, which leverage so. So there are some tools where you can tweak it. And even if you are a young founder, um, and I'm per se not against young founders. I think they're extremely smart people out there and you just need to know where to play it and, and find, find, find kind of the, the framework around, you know, your supporting system usually helps a lot. Uh, thank you. Um, I have two questions. Uh, how do you get your data? Uh, well, like if you can just briefly mention like uh, the most interesting data sources that you use uh, in order to, I guess, mainly mainly interested in the market research, yeah? So the second question is, how do you help uh, startups, I mean corporates, sorry, how do you help corporates make the market research to know what kind of technologies they should be interested in? Yeah. Because not, not all, not they, they might not, not know about all of them and uh, what kind of data uh, do you need to uh, help them like that? Okay. Um. So the data that we're leveraging actually, when, when we do scouting, because we said from the very beginning on, we want to scout worldwide, or at least for the best startups that we have access to. So we were looking for data points that covering Europe, Israel, and the US. China is currently still somehow difficult. And uh, therefore we, we use, like you're, you're starting with desktop to research, no Google, like typically. Um, but there are uh, good good softwares out there. There's like PitchBook, Crunchbase, all the important um, important databases. Um, we 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 are, for example, we are working together with PitchBook in in order to assess those companies. We do have service providers as well that we are collaborating with. So we're trying to be as broad as possible from those data sources. But what, what we've re realized, it depends a lot on the location that you're looking into and what kind of tool you're using. And then you're trying out. And the thing, your, your, your second question is a really interesting one because what we, we, we also leveraged um, a, a technology which is for, for, for the market studies. Now, what we are providing as well is insights, what we see in the market, what is changing, and what kind of direction are things going. So we want to provide that information as well. And we started in providing, let's say, market impact, uh, startup impact reports, we called it. And it's uh, basically, we look at the investments on uh, in, in, in specific startups, and there's an algorithm behind which is clustering those and the cl closer the description. So if the description of two companies is extremely close, they are uh, grouped in one cluster. So I'm, by doing that over a lot of data points, we get insights on where is investment flowing and what kind of direction is it flowing, what kind of stages are those in, and provide that as some input for our experts. And finally, because we use that, especially, and this is an important point, we use that to trigger sometimes also ideas, not because not always our experts do not always know what is the problem that they are having or they can't formulate it very well. So we're also pushing our insights into that one. And that, that's what we're using. We are using, but mainly, investments into venture capital, venture capital investments. Yeah. All right. There's still lots of questions, but we are at the end of our Q&A. So I think Sebastian will be sticking around with us yes. for a drink in the lobby. Uh, so hopefully you can join us in the Cinnabar and um, ask him any more questions that you have. Please give one last round of applause.